Everybody tired? Everybody awake? Everybody stretch? Touch your toes? No? That's too much work? Oh, see? Called me out. Uh, it's good to see you this morning. If you're a guest of ours this morning, uh, there is a card in front of one of the chairs in front of you, called my, the My Way Point card. We just ask you to fill that out and drop it off in the baskets as they come by. We're so glad you're here. Um, we've got some... Uh, as you look on the wall back over there, in the, um, it's just a big prayer wall, and we've got a lot of great um, things to pray for, uh, a lot of things that uh, just people in our church that we're all just uh, either going through or we know somebody going through or praises that are going on. And, and so I just ask you to go by, look at those, pray over them. If you've got a prayer request, uh, fill one out and uh, put it in the, the basket. i got a couple here, and then we're going to pray over just... Um, uh, college and financial aid decisions. Uh, a lot of us have been there, uh, know what that's like. Um, uh, launching of new ministries, uh, family injuries. We had a family uh, friend of uh, somebody that goes here, lost, uh, kid lost a life in a four-wheeler accident, another uh, injury, and so we just pray uh, for them. And then uh, family with praying for uh, financial stability and just uh, putting down roots in this community. And so uh, a lot of things to pray for. So let's, let's gather together. Let's pray together this morning, and then we're going to worship and continue our worship. Father, we, uh, God, we just love you, and we praise you, and we thank you. Uh, God, we thank you that you um, kept us safe uh, on the roads. We thank you that uh, you kept what could have been uh, bad ice storms away. Um, God, we pray that you're glorified in this place this morning. Um, God, I pray for a student that is looking for um, a decision to be made on which university he's going to. God, I pray that you, you direct and you guide uh, and you make it evident, you make it clear. And then that you bring the financial uh, assistance and financial aid to go along with it, Lord. Um, a family starting and praying about starting a new ministry. And uh, God, I pray that you are just, God, that you are in the center of that. God, that you uh, direct and you guide and you give timing and you give exactly what it is that they need. And God, for this family that that lost a loved one in this four-wheeler accident. God, I pray for peace. God, even when we don't understand what's going on, that you are in control of all things, and we pray for peace and we pray for comfort for that family. And a family that's just looking to uh, establish roots here. Uh, God, I pray that you bring along the church and you bring along friends and you bring along financial stability so that they can. And God, we just pray that you are glorified here. Uh, we pray that the Holy Spirit just weighs heavy on us this morning. That you break hearts that need to be broken for you. That you mend hearts that need to be mended. And that you move. We praise you in your son's name we pray.
Glory to God, glory to God forever. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Fix 
Well, it's good to welcome all the refugees from the ice storm. I'm glad you all survived. I was very worried about your safety. Uh, yeah, I, uh, this, this just goes to prove that there's very few true prophets in the world, and none of them are working for the meteorology department. So if you have a Bible, open up to Romans chapter 12. That's where we're going to spend the majority of our morning. Um, man, Hank did a good job last week. I got a chance to go back and watch online. I was tending to a very, very upset little girl last week in, in back in the nursery, but I mean, Hank did such a good job kicking us off uh, last week because we talked about this whole idea of beyond the music and what is worship and talking about worship is giving. I want to kind of grab a hold of and continue that theme this morning with this idea of what is worship and talk to you a little bit more about worship, not just is about giving out of our finances, but about giving of ourselves. Uh, so we're going to, like I said, we're going to kick off in Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Um, it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So, I want to ask you a question this morning. Do you ever stop to think about the extent to which God went to serve you? Now, that is something that should give us all pause, because if you're like me, most of us don't think about that. Uh, when we start thinking about service, we think about, well, you know, I need to volunteer in the nursery, or I need to help out in, you know, inside of, somewhere inside of the church, or I need to serve. You know, service is always seems to start with us. It's very us-centric. But I want you to flip that on your head, on its head for just a second this morning. And I want you to think for just a moment about how God served you. This verse, in verse 1 of Romans chapter 12, it says, by the mercies of God. The mercies of God are the, the thought process of God becoming like us and descending from heaven and coming and serving us. It's a very unique position to find God in. Almighty, all-powerful, all-consuming God as a servant. This idea is incredibly troublesome because we don't think about powerful people being servants. But yet that's who God was, and that's who God is. Ultimately, he serves us first. He serves us not out of a sense of anything that he can get out of us. You realize that, right? We really don't have a whole lot to offer God. I mean, anything that we can do, God can do better, right? He can, he can make anything, do anything, think of anything, and it, could, it would be. So we really truthfully have nothing to offer to him, and yet he serves us anyhow. That he came to us, he left heaven, he took on the form of a man, and he entered into history for the sake of saving us from our sin. When we start talking this morning about serving others, I want you to keep that thought in your mind. Because our service that we offer to other people, this spiritual act of worship that we're going to talk about this morning, is predicated on us first being served by God. In fact, if you, when you hear me talk this morning, you're not going to want to do any of the things that Scripture talks about doing unless you have first been served by Jesus and been saved by Him. Because what we'll talk about this morning with service is all about not doing things for ourselves, but rather doing things for others and ultimately doing things for God for his sake. So when you start looking at this, it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. All right, so when we start talking about sacrifices uh, inside of Scripture, 
if you've grown up in church or been around church a whole lot, your mind immediately goes back to the Old Testament. The Old Testament has this whole series of sacrifices that are supposed to be made. Basically, in the Old Testament, in order for us to kind of understand what it takes for sin to be forgiven, there's an entire system of sacrifices that were supposed to be made on a daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly basis, on an ongoing basis. In fact, at the height of the building of the Jewish temple, the, the smoke that existed from the ongoing sacrifices would have literally covered the sky in some cases at certain places and points of the year because of the number of animals that were being killed and placed on the altar and burned for the sake of keeping the commands of God. So we start talking about sacrifices. The first thing that, you, that comes to my mind is, well, sacrifices are supposed to be dead. I mean, they didn't, like, take these, you know, live bulls and live goats and just toss them on the fire and roast them on a spit and, like, listen to them scream and cry as they burned to death. They killed them first. And so when Paul starts talking about the idea of a living sacrifice, it really truthfully gets me all twisted up in my head. I'm like, that sounds pretty gross, I mean, what are, we actually, what are we actually talking about here? But that's the, the picture that Paul is trying to get across to these Roman Christians as he's talking to them. And I think that he wants us to know and realize is we're not talking about dying for your faith this morning. You know, it's really interesting when we start talking about great people and great leaders inside of Christianity, many times we're talking about people who are martyrs. We're talking about people who ultimately died for their faith. They were crucified, or they were burned, or they were imprisoned until they died, or they were tortured until they died, or all these different horrible things happened to them. And we hold them up as great examples, and when I was in youth, a youth minister, we would read those out you know, to kids, we'd share all these different stories, and we'd always have this group of kids like, yeah, I'm ready to die for my faith, I'm ready to do that, I, I, let's sign me up, that, I will do that, I would go out like that for Jesus. It's a really pretty picture of a bunch of willing martyrs. But you know what? In some ways, it would be very easy to die for your faith. Because your life is over. You don't have to continue to live amidst the brokenness of sin and struggle that's inside of this world. You get to go and spend eternity with Jesus, where things are perfect, where things are much better. What Paul is talking about here is not offering yourself as a dead sacrifice. It's not offering to have your life ended for the sake of your faith. He's talking instead about actually living out your faith. About actively taking your faith and putting it into practice by serving other people. If you'll stop and think for just a second, it, it makes sense that if God served us, we should seek to serve God. And then there are some people that will hear that and like, yeah, that's exactly right, see, Ryan. We have to, like, we see God serving us, and so what we have to do is we have to serve him in the same way. And we serve him enough, and then when we die, if we've served God enough, then we get to go to heaven and spend eternity with Jesus. And that's completely and totally not what we're talking about. I'm not talking about earning your way into heaven. I'm not talking about doing enough good deeds to outweigh your bad in order for you to be able to be accepted by God. You're never going to be able to measure up or match up. I'm not talking about service out of a sense of trying to balance the scales of how you used to live versus how you live now. I'm talking about service that flows out of a pure heart in response to who Jesus is and what he's done and what he's done in your life that you are then compelled to offer your life as a living, ongoing sacrifice in serving other people for the sake of the kingdom of God. Very few people today are willing to do that. Because when you start looking at the kind of service that God calls us to, the kind of service that God requires, the kinds of sacrifices that are involved, it does not measure up with how everyone else lives their life. It just doesn't. It doesn't match. It's a very different way of living when your constant thought is everybody else. We are... We live in a world where everything is bound up in in a very specific way. And that is ultimately that we, we see getting ahead and exceeding a certain standard as being noble and as being righteous. That the ultimate goal is to end up on top of the pile. 
and that pile is different for everybody. For some people, it's a certain amount of money in their bank account. For some people, it's a certain amount of children. For some people, it's the size of their house. For some people, it's a college education. For some, it's, a, it's the, you know, being the, the boss of their own company. For some people, it's being independently wealthy. It's, it's, it's a bunch of different things. It doesn't all have to do with money. Some of you are going, well, you're just going to talk about money. It has nothing always had to do with money. Sometimes it has to do with prestige, success, respect, respect in the eyes of a certain person, respect in the eyes of a certain group of people. All these different different things that just kind of build on it. It's kind of like this idea of, well, when I achieve this, this is what I'm shooting for. It's this pinnacle. It's this ideal. And if I can get there, then I have achieved righteousness. And obviously God is pleased with me because I have achieved this thing that I have set out for myself in order to do and to be. And really, truthfully, over and over again, the world tells us that. In fact, you've got pastors that will sit in church today and will tell you that, you know, what you need to do is you need to tell God what you want. You want to name it, and then you can claim it in God's name because you have given voice to it. Then God is going to give you exactly what you want. That's garbage theology that's not in Scripture. It may sell a lot of books. It may get a big following. But it's the exact antithesis of what Jesus laid out for us as our pattern of life inside of Scripture. There's nothing wrong with being a better person or advancing or getting a promotion or being successful or valued or honored. But here's the thing. It's not who we are called to be as Christians. Those things are nice, but ultimately they are pieces of our lives we should be willing to offer as sacrifices to the God of the universe who died in our place for our sins. Because Jesus calls us to something completely and totally different that doesn't walk in close proximity to the pattern that our world says is good and righteous and just. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is, opens, opens the Sermon on the Mount with this series of statements. You may have read them in church. They were taught, when I was in high school, they were taught in, as, as, an, as, a, as a, at a literary example in my English class, my sophomore English class. They're called the Beatitudes. Some of you have heard of them before. But there, there's all these different little things inside of Matthew chapter 5 that Jesus says are blessed in the kingdom of God. For those of you who aren't familiar, or if you haven't read them in a long time, let me tell you what some of them are. People who are poor in spirit. That sounds like fun. People who are in mourning. People who are meek. People who hunger and thirst for God's righteousness. People who show mercy. People whose hearts are pure. People who make peace. People who are persecuted for their faith. And, my favorite, people who are hated because of their love of God. This sounds like the ultimate Dale Carnegie success course. I think it's all listed in how to win friends and influence people, uh, all, do all these different things. No, it's completely and totally turned on its head. The Beatitudes are not a recipe for worldly success, which is why once Paul tells us that we're supposed to be living sacrifices, look at what it says in verse 2. It says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, verse 2 is one of those verses that when I was a kid got thrown around. We called them clobber verses. They were fantastic. And basically, anytime somebody thought you were doing something that they didn't want you to do, they would come at you going, you're being conformed to the world. Being conformed to the world could be anything from having a certain haircut to wearing a certain style of clothes to listening to a certain type of music to, to being seen in a certain part of town. Uh, there is a long list of things that when I was a kid growing up in the 80s and 90s, we were told was being conformed to the world. When I got to college and actually started to study with people that actually knew and understand what Scripture was actually talking about, I made a very cool discovery. This is not talking about my haircut or how many piercings that I have or don't have in my case. None, zero, don't worry about it. It is talking about a system. When Paul ta- says do not be con- conformed to the world, the word that is used there is talking about the systems of the world. In other words, the way that the world works, operates, and practices. 
Paul is basically telling the church at Rome, don't be practicing your faith in conformity to the way that everyone else out there is living their life. Do not take your love of Jesus and your salvation and the commands of God and try to make them match up with the commands of Roman society, the commands of Roman religion, the commands of of Roman versions of success, happiness, etc., 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 Instead, what does he say? He says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What is this transformation supposed to look like? He's telling the church at Rome, he's saying, look, your mind needs to be conformed not to the way that the world lives their lives, but to the way that God has told you to live your life in the person and work of Jesus and as revealed through Scripture. The Beatitudes. The things that God says he will bless. A way of life that looks completely and totally different from the way everybody else is living their life. We're being transformed in the renewing of our minds by the presence of God's Spirit. When you become a follower of Jesus, God gives you His Spirit living inside of you. For some of you, that's a little weird. You've never thought about it that way before. But here's the thing. It's, what's, it's awesome. It means that you are a living representative of Jesus on earth. And it means that on an ongoing basis, God is making changes in your life because he has come and taken up residence inside of you. And so what begins to happen is, is the impulses that we used to have, the things that we used to want to do, God begins to change. God begins to make us new. Old habits begin to fall away. Old desires begin to fall away. Old patterns of sin begin to fall away. Our lives begin to be changed and transformed. We're made new. Our minds are transformed. One of the most telling occurrences of this is in the way that we respond and relate to other people. How we begin to see other people not as obstacles to overcome or people to manipulate or people to be ahead of or people to boss around or people to lord our position over. But instead we begin to see them as people that we serve. Turn me over to the book of Matthew chapter 25. In Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 31, Jesus begins to give his disciples kind of this final picture of what the final judgment is going to look like. And he uses this idea of of sheep and goats. Cute, cuddly sheep and ugly goats, I guess. I don't know what he was going for there. But in verse 31, he says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne, and before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. And he'll place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, the sheep, he'll say this, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer, truly I say to you, as you did it for one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. So what does Jesus tell his disciples? It's going to be one of the marks of what will separate them from those who don't know him. It'll be how they serve other people. They'll be seeing their act of service as an act of worship directed toward Jesus. That's what he means when he says, when you've done for the least of these, you've done it for me. And what's interesting is this whole, whole ministries have been born out of this passage of Scripture. That's one of the reasons why the church is really good at feeding people. If you need food, we have, a, we have in fact, we have a food pantry here where you can come and get food. It's one of the reasons why there are entire ministries that are dedicated to putting people in clothes that don't have clothes. It's why we have ministries that are dedicated to people who are homeless. 
That's why we have ministries that go into, into prison. I have a friend of mine, two different friends of mine, one in Texas and one in Oklahoma City, that are part of this group called Kairos that goes into prisons and literally does revivals and preaching services and discipleship services with prisoners, people who are on the inside, most, many of them for life, for doing really, really bad things. And we have all these different kinds of ministries. And, and I love this passage because really truthfully, if it wasn't for people who love Jesus, in a lot of cases, a lot of the things that we do for people who are poor or who are in prison or who are homeless or all these different things wouldn't happen. The church has always led the way in doing those kinds of things. But to be honest with you, over the last few years, I've really struggled with this passage because I think that we take this passage and we say to ourselves, well, if I'm doing nice things for people who are hungry and doing nice things for people who need clothes and doing nice things for people who are in prison, then obviously I'm doing the things that God wants me to do. And we've become very limiting, saying that our service is kind of limited by what's laid out in this passage. In fact, in a lot of cases, we say, well, there's not really a place for me to serve in church because everybody's already doing all the things that, I, that need to be done. If there's, always, there's people that are taking care of food and people that are taking care of clothes and people that are taking care of the nursery and people that are taking care of people who are in prison and people who are homeless. So I really don't have a place to serve. So my job, really truthfully, is just to come sit down and be here and write my tithe check because I heard what Hank preached about last Sunday, so apparently I need to give too. So I'm going to give and we're good. All right. But there's more of an implication here about how we should be serving. It says when we serve the least of these. Well, let me ask you a question this morning. What about when your spouse is the least of these? Are you going to serve them? What about your kid? And I'm not just talking about your good kids. I'm talking about the kid that's a struggle. Parents, stop. <laughs> there are three people just patted Jacob. <laughs> I got you, bro. <laughs> I got you, bro. I'm talking about the kid that's a struggle. I'm talking about the kid that barely made it here this morning without you leaving them on the side of the road and saying good luck. What about when our kid is the least of these? What about, now I'm fixing to step on your toes. What about not your kid, but those other kids that don't know how to behave? You know the ones I'm talking about. Some of you are thinking about somebody else's child right now. Shame on you. But seriously, what about serving those kids that don't know how to behave? Teachers, what about that kid? That you know that tomorrow comes school, when school gets back in session, you're going to have to, it's everything you're going to do not to throw them out the window if you have windows in your school. What about serving those kids? What about the checker at the supermarket the day before an ice storm? Can you think of anybody more least of these at that moment? People lined up buying 80 loaves of bread. Don't know where they're going to put it, but they need it, all of it. And that poor checker that's been there since 4 o'clock and just got told she's staying an extra four hours, and so you get to her or him, and they're in the worst mood possible. What about serving them? What about the guy who shows up at your mechanic shop five minutes before you're supposed to close with a car with a flashing check engine light? See, that's the thing is I'm thankful for people who serve others who are the least of these by serving Jesus. That was me on Thursday. Had to go to Texas this week for Amanda's grandmother's funeral. Quick 24-hour trip. My least favorite kind of trip to Texas. Down and back. And coming back, coming through Gainesville, there's one of those incredibly awesome Texas construction zones. You know the one, the one that backs up traffic for three miles behind it, and it's for 20 feet of road construction. And that 20 feet of road construction is a bunch of guys who are leaned up against their trucks pointing at that point in time. Sometimes those guys are the least of these. Come out of that road construction, and all of a sudden my car starts just running rough, and my check engine light starts flashing. Now, for those of you who are not mechanically inclined, like me, check engine lights that are flashing only mean one thing, bad. So all I'm thinking to myself is I have a wife and three children in the car and the temperature is dropping rapidly and I'm trying to get home before the ice apocalypse hits. Obviously, I should have been very worried. 
And I have no idea where to go. The only thing I do know is that AutoZone will let you use their code reader for free. So I'm thinking to myself, at least I can pull into AutoZone, check the code, see what's going on, and find out. So I get in there. The guy brings the code reader out. Very nice guy comes in, does the code, does the code reader. I'm in there, and I'm looking at it, and the guy reads me the list, the list of things that are supposedly wrong with my car. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, I'm so screwed. <laughs> and the guy that's, that's, that's there is looking at me, what's wrong with it? And, and the, not the guy that read the code, but another guy that's there who's already in a bad mood. Like, What's wrong with it? And I said, well, the check engine light's blinking. He goes, usually that's what happens when your engine's going to take a crap on you. Good luck. And walks out the door. And I'm thinking to myself, great. So the very nice guy who's helping me, I'm like, thank you very much, sir, for the gloom and doom. I really appreciate it. So the very nice guy who's read my code, I asked the guy, I said, is there a reputable mechanic that you think would be willing to take a look at the car? I said, I'm in a car with my wife my, and three of my kids. He did not ask, how many kids do you have? Thank you, Lord. He goes, yeah, there's one right next door. And I look at him and I say, would you trust him? I said, I'm trying to get home to Oklahoma. And he goes, he's a good guy. I pull over and I walk in the door and there's a guy standing there and it is a custom shop. It is a shop where basically they do lifts and fancy paint jobs and put nitros on cars and all kinds of other fun stuff. And this guy turns around and looks at me, and he's not looking incredibly friendly. And I said, sir, I said, I'm from Oklahoma City. I'm trying to get home. I've got my wife and three kids in the car. My car, just my check engine light just started blinking. I said, the guy next door said that I could bring it over here and you'd at least take a look at it. And he just looks at me. And he goes, pull it around. So I pull it around. He starts messing with it, starts messing with it. And I look at the clock, and it's, it's five till four. And on the shop door, his hours are printed 9 to 4. And I'm like, I have made this whole guy's day. This guy messes around with a car, tells me to go over to AutoZone, buy a part. I go get it, come back over. He puts it on, still blinking. He sends me over to buy another part, comes over, he does this whole little thing. I don't know what he does, magic, I guess. I'm surprised he didn't have a Harry Potter wand or whatever. And it's all fixed. And it's almost 5 o'clock. And he's still got work to do inside. And I look up, and I notice on his sign that there's a cross. And, I, and I've told him as we've kind of talked while, while we've been down there, I'd gone down there to do my wife's grandmother's funeral and my pastor and all those different things. And I look at him and I said, do you think this is fixed? Do you think I'm going to be able to get to Texas or to Oklahoma City? And he looks at me and he goes, you just keep the faith. It will be fine. And he puts the car, all the different things back together, shuts it, and I'm like, how much do I owe you? It's 50 bucks. See, here's the thing. I was the least of these. And he saw Jesus. And he used his talent to serve. See, folks, that's, that's the thing is we're not just called to serve this little list of people that Jesus uses as examples in Matthew 25. We're called to serve the world, our enemies, people who voted differently from us, people who got the promotion that we think we should have gotten, the boss who makes our life a living hell. We're called to serve people. And you take our talents and our gifts and our skills and offer them to others as if we were offering them to Jesus. It's our spiritual act of worship. In a letter to the church at Colossae, in Colossians chapter 3, Paul writes, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you'll receive the inheritance of your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. You, me, all of us, we've been given skills, talents, abilities. And they're not ours. They're gifts. They're talents that came from God. And what he's calling us to do is to live our lives as living sacrifices. It's our spiritual act of worship, to take the things that God has given us and give them back to other people. Why? For the sake of the gospel. For God to receive glory. 
as our acts of service call men and women and children to salvation. See, the guy, the mechanic, he knew I was a Christian. We're having a conversation about what I do and all these different things. He knows I'm a follower of Christ. But I don't think it would have made any difference to him because he was already working on the car before he found that out. He was taking his skills and his talents and he was using them to serve the least of these. How many opportunities do we miss to share about Jesus and who he is and what he's done? Because we are too busy living our lives conformed to a different pattern. And instead of serving others and serving Jesus, serving ourselves. I ask you, what are your skills? What are your talents? What are the gifts that God has given to you? See, one of the reasons why I think this, this, this sermon and this series is so incredibly important is because it gets us out of the mindset of thinking about worship as something that has to do with what we do on Sundays. Way too often we start talking about serving inside of the church. All we think about is, well, does that mean I work in the nursery or volunteer with the youth group? I can't play an instrument, so that's out. Well, there's not really anything else for me to do. Let's well, there's a missions project, or I can go, I can go work at Mission OK. But that's, I mean, that's it. Those are the only places to serve. That's not true. Your service does not stop here. In fact, for many of us, just because of the size of the church that we are and the, the amount of things that we have going on, the most important acts of service that you will do will never happen inside of this building. They will happen out there. And you know where we need to be concentrating on serving? Out there. In your sphere of influence, in your neighborhood, at your job, at your gym that we all joined on January 1st. Why? Because that's where our talents are needed. If you go back to Romans 12, and you look at, as Paul kind of breaks this down, he lists several different skills and talents, things that are used inside of the church. But look at verse 4. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one in Christ and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Look at the next part of the verse. Let us use them. If you're in a paper Bible, circle that. Underline it. If you're highlighting on your phone or on your tablet, highlight that verse. Well, the idea of we use them. God didn't give you skills and talents and gifts for them to be kept for your own personal satisfaction. He gave them to you to use. For what? For the sake of his glory. Not for what they can gain you, but for how they can make Jesus known and how they can bring God glory. We're not talking about abusing our gifts for God's, for abusing God's gifts for our gain. We're talking about using the talents God's given us to give back to him. Go back to Romans 12.1. To present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Living for Jesus, serving others. It's an act of worship. It is a sacrifice because we're in discomfort, living outside the norms of the world and the world's way of doing things, and instead living in that tension of living for Jesus and doing things God's way in the midst of everybody else telling us that's weird. That doesn't make sense. Stop and take stock of this for just a minute. If you're taking notes, think about this. Write this down. Where in your life are you not using your gifts and talents to serve other people? Instead, you're using them to serve yourself. Those are places where you are not worshiping God. You're worshiping something other than God, which by definition is an idol. In those instances where you're not using your gifts and talents to serve others, to worship Jesus, who are you worshiping? What are you worshiping? If you're taking notes, write it down. What is it? 
Remember the note card from a couple weeks ago? I bet it equates in some places, doesn't it? Your gifts, your talents offered to that idol. How do we repent of that? I'm going to give you four things. And then we'll close. The first one is this. We repent of not serving by saying no to self-gain and saying yes to sacrifice. The second one is this. We say no to appeasement of the ways of the world and yes to walking in agreement with the Holy Spirit. Which, by the way, would be in line with Scripture. Third, we say no to sin. And we say yes to righteousness. And fourthly, we say no to a system and we say yes to a Savior. We are here this morning. The most important thing you can hear is that these acts of service don't flow out of us trying to make ourselves better. If we could do that, we wouldn't need a Savior. We need a Savior. His name is Jesus. And God served us first by leaving heaven and coming to earth and dying on a cross for our sins. The good news of the gospel is is that Jesus' death is available to you. Jesus' forgiveness is available to you. That this morning you can be forgiven of your sins and you can trust Christ as your Savior. There's some of you here this morning, you may have never done that. And I would invite you this morning not to seek to serve others, but to allow God to serve you by saving you from your sin. For there are many of you that are here this morning that you do know a Savior. And you have experienced that great service that comes from Jesus' death for you. My question to you this morning is, how are you worshiping him by serving others? And where are you failing to do that? Where are you worshiping something other than Jesus with the skills, talents, and gifts that God's given you? I'm going to invite the band to go ahead and come back up. We're going to have a time of response here in just a second. And you can respond in a variety of ways. Some of you may want to come up here. You may want to pray. You may want to go grab somebody who you came with and talk to them and ask them to hold you accountable. You may want to come to the back. There will be several folks in the back that would love to visit with you and pray with you. If you're here this morning, you need to know what it means to follow Christ. When we do our time of response, would you come grab me and let me know? I would love to explain to you what it means to trust Jesus as your Savior this morning. But if you're here and you're a Christian, where are you worshiping something other than Jesus? with the skills, talents, and abilities that he's given you? Where are you conforming to the way of the world? Where are you pursuing things in a fashion that puts you in line with people who don't know Christ rather than people who do? How can you leave here today and offer yourself to somebody else for the sake of the gospel? as an act of worship, as a living sacrifice. Would you stand with me? Let's pray together. (coughs) Jesus, this is one of those sermons that as I'm trying to put it together, it was really a struggle, and then Thursday happened, and it all kind of snapped. I'm so thankful for, for Ray, that he would see me and my family as the least of these and be willing to serve us this week to be my answer to prayer. Father, how many times in my life am I not an answer to somebody else's? Do I have the ability? Do I have the skill? Do I have the gift? Do I have the talent? And instead of offering it, I hoard it for myself. Father, forgive me for doing that. Father, I pray for those this morning that have never had you serve them that have never trusted you as Savior. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that they this morning would be so moved, not by my words, but by your Spirit, that they would ask you to save them from their sins this morning. They would begin a journey of serving you by being served by you. 
Father, I pray for those of us that are here this morning that are your followers. God, every one of us struggles with this in some area. Placing other things, other goals, other people, other possessions, all kinds of other things ahead of you. And although we serve well in some, in some places we hold back. Jesus, I thank you that you held nothing back. And I pray that you would continue to be our example and our challenge and our pursuit. That we would offer ourselves, Father, not just be willing to throw up our hands and say, oh, I would die for Jesus, but instead be willing to do the really radical thing, which is to truthfully live for him by offering ourselves as living sacrifices, seeking to serve those who who come into our lives as the least of these. Father, help us to see others with the eyes that you saw us as people who are in need of a Savior. And offer what we have as an inroad for the gospel to tell others about Jesus. Father, I pray we would respond now. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Justice and faith become my embrace to love you from the inside. Cries out. 
control consume me from the inside out let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out Amen. we have announcements Sweet. I'll pray us out of here. Danny, you want to pray us out of here? Okay. Father, thank you for this morning that uh, we were able to be here. Uh, God, and you kind of kept the impending doom <laughs> away. Uh, Father, just give us servant-like hearts because you did serve us and you set a perfect example. Uh, Father, help us to know you better this week. It's your name we pray. Amen.